The 1980s, a pivotal era for Colombia, a nation steeped in contrasts. As the world danced on the brink of a new millennium, Colombia grappled with a dichotomy of promise and peril. Medellin, Colombia was a city in the grip of a storm. At the center of it all stood one man, a name that would echo through history. Pablo Escobar. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on December 1, 1949, in Rio Negro, Antioquia, Colombia. His family later moved to the suburb of Envigado. He was the third of seven children born in poverty to a schoolteacher mother and a peasant farmer father. From an early age, Escobar packed a unique ambition to raise himself up from his humble beginnings and dreamed of becoming the president of Colombia one day. Escobar reportedly began his life of crime early, stealing tombstones and selling phony diplomas. It wasn't long before he started stealing cars, then moving into the smuggling business. Escobar's early prominence came during the Marlboro Wars, in which he played a high-profile role in the control of Colombia's smuggled cigarette market. Beginning in the early 1970s, Colombia became a prime smuggling ground for marijuana. But as the cocaine market flourished, Colombia's geographical location proved to be its biggest asset. Situated at the northern tip of South America, between the thriving coca cultivation epicenters of Peru and Bolivia, the country came to dominate the global cocaine trade with the United States, the biggest market for the drug, and just a short trip to the north. Under Escobar's leadership, large amounts of coca paste were purchased in Bolivia and Peru, then processed and transported to America. Escobar worked with a small group to form the infamous Medellin Cartel. As the demand for cocaine grew in the United States, Escobar established additional smuggling shipments and distribution networks in various locations. By the mid-1980s, Escobar had an estimated net worth of $30 billion and was named one of the 10 richest people on earth by Forbes. Still harboring his youthful ambition to become the nation's president, Escobar entered politics and supported the formation of the Liberal Party of Colombia. In 1982, he was elected as an alternate member of Colombia's Congress. Escobar was responsible for the killing of thousands of people, including politicians, civil servants, journalists, and ordinary citizens. When he realized that he had no shot of becoming Colombia's president, and with the United States pushing for his capture and extradition, Escobar unleashed his fury on his enemies in the hopes of influencing Colombian politics. By the 1990s, Escobar was facing increasing pressure from the administration of President Cesar Gaviria, particularly after Escobar's alleged assassination of presidential candidate Luis Carlos Galán in 1989. In June 1991, Escobar negotiated a surrender to Gaviria's government in exchange for a reduced sentence and preferential treatment during his captivity. A law at the time prevented his extradition to the United States. Escobar's family unsuccessfully sought asylum in Germany and eventually found refuge in a Bogota hotel. Pablo Escobar, a name often associated with crime, holds a surprising story. He achieved staggering success, though for the wrong reasons. With shrewd strategies and powerful connections, Escobar ran a criminal enterprise far ahead of its time. Even with the might of the United States, the Colombian government struggled to stop him. At his peak, Escobar's influence rivaled that of a president. Let's discover the hidden truths about this infamous figure, shedding light on the lesser-known aspects of Pablo Escobar's life. At 26, Pablo Escobar got married. Pablo Escobar entered a new chapter in his life, exchanging vows. The story takes an unexpected turn when, in the town of Envigado, Colombia, he encounters Maria Victoria Hanau, a mere 13 years old. Their remarkable journey continues as, at the age of 15, Maria Victoria Hanau becomes the wife of the 26-year-old Escobar. Pablo Escobar's son is named Juan Escobar. In a curious twist of fate, Juan Pablo Escobar Henao, the son of Pablo Escobar, made a profound decision. Feeling that his given name carried an eerie weight, he chose to adopt a new identity, Sebastian Marroquin. 
This transformation stemmed from a remarkable encounter with a voodoo priest in Mozambique who spoke of an unsettling curse tied to his birth name. At his prime, Pablo Escobar made a whopping 420 million every week. In the zenith of his power, Pablo Escobar's empire reached unimaginable heights. The Medellin cartel, under his dominion, held an iron grip on the cocaine industry. It said that each week Escobar amassed a staggering $420 million in earnings. Escobar went to extreme lengths to keep his family warm, actually burning real money for heat. In the early 90s, as they were on the run, Escobar spent approximately $2 million to keep his family warm on chilly nights. They frequently changed locations, and to maintain secrecy, Pablo would occasionally blindfold his family every other day so they wouldn't know their whereabouts. Pablo Escobar owned a multitude of properties. Pablo Escobar's wealth knew no bounds. He possessed a vast fleet of airplanes, helicopters, and yachts, complemented by an array of luxurious houses scattered across the country. Colombian authorities, in their efforts to dismantle his empire, laid claim to a staggering haul. 141 houses, 142 planes, 20 helicopters, and 32 yachts. In 1991, Pablo Escobar surrendered himself to the government. As part of this agreement, Escobar would be confined to a prison of his own making, famously known as La Catedral. La Catedral, Pablo Escobar's personally designed prison, boasted a commanding view of Medellin. Despite its intended purpose, this self-built prison was more akin to a lavish retreat. It featured opulent amenities, including entertainment facilities, a football pitch, a bar, a jacuzzi, and even a colossal dollhouse purportedly frequented by escorts. Pablo Escobar was captured in a photograph taken at the White House. Pablo Escobar's journey into the world of cocaine began in the early 1970s in collaboration with his cartel associates. Surprisingly, there exists a rare photograph of Escobar and his family, taken in 1981, standing in front of the White House, just as civilians. Around the same time, Escobar treated his family to an unforgettable first-class trip to Disneyland. Escobar bought heaps of rubber bands to keep his money in order. Pablo Escobar faced a unique challenge. He couldn't deposit all his wealth in banks. To tackle this, he resorted to an unusual solution, spending over $2,500 every month on rubber bands just to secure his cash. This intriguing detail stands out as one of the more unconventional facts about Pablo Escobar. Escobar was not so lucky. Colombian law enforcement finally caught up to the fugitive Escobar on December 2, 1993, in a middle-class neighborhood in Medellin. A firefight ensued, and as Escobar tried to escape across a series of rooftops, he and his bodyguard were shot and killed. Escobar had just turned 44 years old the previous day. Today, Colombia has emerged from the shadows of its tumultuous past. But the legacy of Pablo Escobar endures, a stark reminder of the price of power and the cost of ambition. This has been Pablo Escobar, the rise and fall of the kingpin, a testament to a man whose name will forever be etched in history.